definitions of what con a conformal map is differ slightly, but the Stein definition is follows that if f goes from u into v and is bijective, and holomorphic, then we say it's conformal. Okay, so we have some subset of the complex plane U and we are mapping it bijectively onto some subset V and that's what we call the conformal mapping, okay? At least in the convention of Stein. So here's a, here's a result uh, proposition. So suppose we have F goes from U into V and it's holomorphic and injective. Then f prime of z is not equal to zero for any z belong to u, and the inverse mapping f to the minus one of the image back to u is also holomorphic. All right, so I'll do the first part first. So proof. Now, the reason we can prove this, uh, well, I mean, this is, this is true in more generality, but the reason we can prove this in a very efficient way, as you're about to see, or a very neat way, is because of the very special things about holomorphic mappings that we know. Um, so we're gonna argue by contradiction. So suppose that we have that f prime of z0 is actually equal to zero for some particular point z0 belonging to our set u. Okay, so what kind of structure can f have around z0? How can this happen? So here's a kind of hint. So consider the mapping G of Z, which we're going to define to be equal to F of Z minus F of Z zero. All right, tell me about G of Z in particular. Tell me about G of Z around Z zero. Come on, people. Audience participation, come on. We know it's holomorphic, right? We know that we know that the way we've constructed it, g of z0 is zero, and as you say, the derivative is also zero because you just differentiate this thing, and that's what we get. Okay, so now let's just think about g. What kind of mapping can we have around z0 if we have that stuff going on? What's the nature of g in this situation? This is, this is, this is something which we use over and over again. This is one of the Basic ideas. What what do we know about G when we have stuff like this? How can G possibly be? What's the nature of G locally around Z0? So Z0 is a zero of G. And we've learned this characterization of zeros, right? That G of Z therefore is Z minus Z0 to some M times a holomorphic function Z. We've done this particular characterization many, many times, right? A lot of stuff comes out from the fact that we can explicitly say what things behave like around their zeros because we have this form where H is holomorphic and H of Z zero is not equal to zero. And this holds true in some neighborhood Some, ah, uh, yeah. So on a very small scale, then Z is very close to Z zero. So H of 
z is very much just like the constant h of z0, right? Yeah. So as you say, it's somewhat like a polynomial, like z minus z0 to the n, yeah? Yeah. Cool. So this is our point x0. We have some little ball around it. Yeah. What is this mapping doing to it? What is the action here? What is happening to a small ball like this? If I drew the image of if I drew the image of this small ball, and let me put something inside it. Suppose I put, suppose I put this like arrow, semicircular arrow. What happens to the image of the semicircular arrow under the action of this mapping? So for sure, g of z0 goes to 0, right? So we are, let me change this a little bit. We are sending this to zero, yeah? What happens to the image of this of this semicircular arrow? I mean, this is a really explicit thing, right? Because we're taking r to be as small as we like, so we could just forget about this thing, it's just like a constant, right? So if I just had a constant here, then we could explicitly calculate everything, right? And then what would you see? What would you draw? What would the image of this semicircular arrow be? Roughly. Come on. It depends what the order of this M is, right? Yeah. But this thing would be going. I mean, M is going to be at least two, right? Yeah. So if I have a semicircle, then this thing at least gets turned into a circle. Yeah. And maybe it's wrapping around many more times if M is higher. Yeah. Yeah. So whatever, so the arrow looks like this. So this is what's happening to the image of this thing, yeah? In particular, this little ball is taken and wrapped around itself at least one time, yeah? Because we have to have that m is bigger than or equal to two, yeah? Because we know that both g is a zero and g prime is a zero, so we can't just have m equals one, yeah? Cool. All right, so that means that locally, I'm going to take some piece of paper. We are taking our space and we are wrapping around itself like this, right? That's what we're doing. Yeah? At least once, maybe twice, maybe whatever. Yeah? So, this thing locally does not look like it's injective anymore. Yeah? At all. Yeah? Yeah? So, we would expect this to be true, that this theorem is true, because if we had a point where the derivative was zero, then we can create this function, yeah? Which is the same as f, we're just shifting it by some particular constant, right? And if we look locally, then what's it doing? It's taking the ball, around z0 and it's wrapping it around itself at least two times, whatever. However many m is, it's wrapping around itself m times, yeah? Which doesn't look like, a, uh, well, which doesn't look like injective behavior at all, right? Yeah? So that's the idea of the proof. So what I'm really emphasizing a lot is to visualize the picture of what this stuff is all the time, to turn this into pictures, and that's all we're doing. We are we are arguing by contradiction. We are setting up the consequences of this contradiction, and we're saying, okay, what does it look like? Well, it looks like this. Huh? And the key idea, uh, or the key thing which we're using, which we've used many times, is that the structure of holomorphic functions is so special that, that when they have zeros, it's of a very particular kind. You know? When they have zeros, there's a very particular kind. It's something like this, you know? which means that it's going down to zero in a very, very special way. And all kinds of stuff follows from that, right? So that's one of the key principles. I'm hoping you, you people have solidly in your heads that 
the behavior of holomorphic functions around their zeros is incredibly, incredibly regular. It's incredibly understandable, which is not true outside of holomorphic mappings. If you try and do this for mappings from Rm to Rn, it's just nothing so nice it happens. Huh? So this is one of the big gifts that this subject gives to us, that we understand locally very, very well what happens. Yeah? In calculus, we understand very well what happens when the derivative exists. Yeah? But this doesn't require the derivative to exist. This is everywhere. So everywhere we understand very, very well what happens. Yeah? Yeah? Cool. All right, that's one of the key principles, which is the principle we're going to use. Cool, so that establishes the theorem. And so what have we learned? So f goes from u to v, injective. Ah, I should have also said that since this is non-zero, this limit exists and is a finite number. So we're also using the fact that this is non-zero. This is injective, implies that f prime of z is not equal to zero, and f to the minus one is holomorphic. Cool. And recall, we are saying that something is conformal if it's holomorphic and invertible, in other words, injective. Yeah? Yeah? And we say, we say that U and the image of U under an injective holomorphic mapping are conformally equivalent. Because we go backwards and forwards with our, with our bijective holomorphic mapping. So conformally equivalent. Okay, cool. So this is Stein's definition of a conformal mapping. It's a holomorphic injective mapping. Um, some other books define it like this. So sometimes defined as f prime of z is not equal to zero on uh, omega. All right. So this is obviously a more general definition because we've shown that if it's injective, then this is satisfied here. Yeah? But maybe they're the same. Probably not given the way I set it up. If they're not the same, tell me, tell me how they're not the same, what's a counterexample? I'm gonna raise the board. Tell me why this definition doesn't imply the Stein's definition. So, simple example. Would just be z goes to z squared on the complex numbers take away zero. Yeah? So this thing has non-zero derivative on this open set omega. Let's call that f. But it's very much non-injective. It's wrapping around two times, right? So every single point on the image has exactly two pre-images. Yeah? So, but not injective. So this is indeed a more general definition, but it's a reasonable definition in 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 many ways. Because what do we actually care about in terms of conformality? Well, when we started right at the beginning of the course describing what the structure of mappings that were differentiable were like, we did this thing of saying, okay, if we consider f tilde of x, y to be equal to f of x plus i, y, I want to call it g because we just used f. Where... G is holomorphic, 
then the gradient of this guy is a two by two matrix, right? So it's G1, comma, uh, use the X notation, G1, comma, X, X, Y, G2, comma, X, X, Y, G1, comma, Y, X, Y, G2, comma, Y. Right? And we saw that this belongs to these conformal matrices. And these matrices are just lambda times a rotation. Yeah? So if we look on a very small scale in particular, so if this is some point here where we're taking the derivative x0, y0, and we have, say, a couple of lines crossing at some angle, theta, yeah? then what's this picture when we map it? It's going to be mapped around g tilde of x0, y0, right? This point. And the lines could be sent in different directions, right? But the angle between them will still be preserved, right? Because that's the nature of what this thing does, right? Yeah? So, but these are angle-preserving mappings. These are angle-preserving mappings locally whenever the derivative is non-zero. You know? So um, that is, as we'll see later, one of the key important properties that we like about conformal mappings.